Yeah, so actually, I will start. Uh, I, I won't talk about the stationary Prandtl equation right away because uh, I ran a bit late yesterday, so I need, still need to, to finish uh, yesterday's lecture. So <coughs> uh, I'm still in within the second lecture uh, where I was uh, explaining some limitations and extensions of uh, the, what I would call the linear methodology. Okay, so the linear methodology is what I explained in the first lecture. And uh, so yesterday I took a bit of time to explain what happens in uh, what I call the degenerate cases. And at the very end, um, I, I I told you about uh, another extension that I uh, wanted to present, which was the case of rough boundaries. Okay, so I very briefly sketched the, the setting yesterday, but let me uh, remind you what it is. So just to, to explain how it works, I'm uh, looking at the linear equation, the same one as yesterday, which is dx psi epsilon minus uh, epsilon Laplacian square of psi epsilon equals some function f in a domain omega epsilon, which is rough, okay? Uh, with psi epsilon on the boundary of omega epsilon equals the normal derivative of psi epsilon on the normal boundary of omega epsilon equal to zero, okay? Uh, so yesterday I studied the boundary layers for this equation. I showed you that they were different on the eastern, western, northern, southern boundary, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so today this is not really my focus. My focus is really uh, on rough boundaries. And so I'm taking omega epsilon to be um, the following domain. So it's a domain in R2 um, in which you have a small scale on the boundary, okay, over x1 and y between 0 and 1, okay? So I drew a, a picture yesterday, so omega epsilon looks like this, okay? So this is uh, the small scale structure, which typically has size epsilon to the one-third in both directions, and this has size 1. So again, this is really uh, an idealized model. I can complicate it in a number of ways. Uh, I can add some nonlinear terms. I can add a term of order two in the equation. Uh, I can take a more complicated domain with uh, uh, you know, curved boundaries here and there and so on. This is just to, ex okay, to, to, to explain the methodology. Okay? But everything I'm going to explain for, well, uh, for this equation was in the PhD uh, thesis of uh, Gabriela Lopez Ruiz, who was a student of mine and who defended her PhD in December. Okay? Uh, so if gamma is periodic, so that's a first uh, remark. So uh, maybe I just, well, well one thing before, uh, be before I go into this. Uh, this epsilon to the one-third here is there because it's exactly the scaling of the boundary layer, which we computed yesterday. Okay. So uh, I would say that this is the, the richest scaling because the, the, the small scale structure that you have on the boundary is precisely the same one as the one that is dictated by the boundary layer analysis. And so you have an interaction, let's say, between the the scale that is dictated by the linear uh, problem, okay, in which you have a small scales because of the boundary layer and the small scales in the boundary, okay. And so the ansatz is that psi epsilon should behave like some interior function psi bar, which is the same one as yesterday, plus some boundary layer term, uh, so which I will denote psi blw. Uh, which depends on the boundary layer uh, variable x over epsilon. It also has a small scale dependency with respect to y because of the rough boundary. Okay? And it also depends on the macroscopic variable y. And when you plug this ansatz into the equation, you find that psi blw satisfies the following equation. 
Okay, I'll drop the BL. In Omega BL. Uh, with, uh, let's say, Psi W on the boundary equals something which I will denote Psi naught. And it's normal derivative. equals psi 1. Okay? And so omega BL is the domain capital X. So here uh, it's a Laplacian with respect to the fast variables. This one is the one that I call capital X. This one is the one that I call capital Y. And it's this unbounded domain. Okay? So it's unbounded in all directions. And this is where uh, the difficulties come from. So first, a remark. Um, there is a case when the analysis is uh, slightly easier, and it is a case when gamma is periodic. Uh, yes, just a second. Uh, just let me write that, and I'll get back to you. Yes? A zero and a. Yeah, uh, so, these are, uh, so here there are generic functions, but in that problem, there are the traces of psi bar on the boundary the of psi bar and its normal derivative. So psi naught will be uh, psi bar at actually uh, x equals 0. Okay? And this one will be uh, uh, the gradient of psi bar at x equals 0, uh, scalar with the normal derivative to omega bn. Okay? But okay, he, actually throughout the the analysis, I can take some very uh, general functions, psi naught and psi 1, that depends on capital Y. Depends on capital y. So if gamma is periodic, actually, uh, you, re you retrieve some compactness with respect to Y. Uh, okay? So actually, uh, in that case, it's reasonable to look for periodic solutions. So you look for periodic solutions in, uh, in Y. And Therefore, you kind of get rid of the fact that you have an unbounded domain in Y. So your domain is still unbounded in X, but, uh, but you retrieve some compactness in the Y variable. Okay? So you have a compactness in Y. And actually, in that case, uh, you can solve this problem which I would call maybe a BLW, okay? Uh, and then you can solve uh, BLW in uh, periodic spaces. Periodic spaces. Uh, and then to, to solve that problem, actually, it's really a, it's a consequence of the lax milligram lemma, okay? Things are, uh, okay, uh, fairly standard, okay? So you have a. So when you have a periodicity in the y variable, then things are not so bad, and you uh, you can check that there exists a unique solution in uh, H two of this uh, of this uh, of this problem. Okay, uh, and this was done again in a more complicated setting by uh, Didier Brèche and David Girardvare. Uh, and actually, so they included some nonlinear terms and so on, and worked in a more uh, complicated domain. But uh, but as a subproduct, they had the well posedness of that problem. But so here, I want to look at cases when gamma is not periodic. So I really have to deal with the whole unboundedness in uh, in both directions. And so the first question that you need to ask yourself is. Uh, when you lose the, uh, or when you drop the periodicity, what is the good functional space in which to look for solutions? Because here, the important point is that uh, your solutions will have infinite energy. In other words, you're not looking for solutions that have decay in the variable y. Okay? Your solutions will decay with respect to x, far from the boundary, the boundary layer, that's what you expect. But with respect to y, you have no decay whatsoever. Okay? If you think of your boundary data, for instance, here, psi bar is constant with respect to y, so it has no decay. And if your data is not decaying, there is no reason a priori why your solution should be decayed. Yeah, it's... 
Yes, exactly. Exactly. So it's an equation. So I will forget about small y in the following. I just consider a capital X and capital Y. And so you have no decay in capital Y. And in general, so the, the best that you can hope is that, let's say, you're bounded with respect to capital Y. So let's say you're an infinity or WK infinity, but no better than that. Okay? But actually, you know that L infinity spaces are not so, so good to. Uh, well, because they are not Hilbert spaces, okay? So they're not so nice to do the, the whole analysis. And so the, the good setting, actually, uh, the good functional setting are Kato spaces, which are, uh, so HS Hulock spaces. So let me uh, introduce them, just uh, to, uh, to explain. You do the, the following, so in, uh, in Rd, or so in R2 in the, in the following case. So in Rd, so D would be equal to 2 here. You uh, take a function, let's say, eta, which is smooth and compactly supported. Okay, and which is a partition of unity, which is such that you can write one as the sum over all k in Zd of translations of eta. Okay, you can construct such a thing. Okay, you can even. Uh, have requirements on what the support of eta should you can impose that eta is uh, constant and equal to one on a neighborhood of zero and supported in a in a ball of radius two or something like that. Okay, but uh, okay, let me just write uh, uh, in the following way, and then I say that u belongs to H S u lock if and only if first u belongs to H S lock. Okay, and if I take the supremum of all for all k in Zd of uh, u times eta translated by k in Hs, this is finite. Okay, so look at what this means. I'm looking at the Hs norm of u centered on a ball uh, around uh, x equal k. Okay, and I'm taking the supremum with respect to all such balls, and I'm requiring that this is finite. Okay, so typically, if you have a function that is in a WK infinity for k sufficiently large, say k bigger than s, then this will be in HS log. It's just telling all, uh, or uh, also HS log contains all HS periodic functions. Okay, so it's a way of, uh, let's say, extending the, the periodic setting to functions that, you know, have no decay. You still keep a bit of Hilbert structure because here you're measuring things in HS, right? Uh, but you, okay, you, you don't uh, need to have any assumption on the structure of gamma or its uh, correlations or uh, anything. Okay, so this is the typical setting that you, that you want to work with. And uh, the, uh, the thing that is nice with it is that um, all functions that are in HS u lock uh, are also in the uh, in S prime. And so you can perform free analysis on functions in HS u lock, at least in the sense of distribution. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why there are Nice to work with. So, uh, get a remark. All right. Uh, for your analysis. Is okay in HS lock. Okay. So uh, this space HS U lock is uh, essentially the way that you deal with the unboundedness in, 
in Y, and I will uh, come back to that a little later uh, uh, at the very end of uh, that that section. Uh, but now uh, the, the question that I want to address is uh, how you deal with uh, the unboundedness in X. Okay. And so this was a very nice idea by uh, David Gervare and Nader Masmoudi. Uh, where they, uh, so they introduced this for the Stokes operator uh, in a, I think, in a, in a bumped half space. Uh, and so David, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's an idea that comes from numerical analysis in the beginning, which is to, uh, the, the idea is that if you work in an unbounded domain, uh, at least in some cases, what you can do is, uh, Look at what happens in uh, okay in, in a half plane and uh, replace all the behavior in a half plane by a transparent boundary condition, so as to work in a bounded domain, but with a transparent boundary condition at the at the, the outer frontier. Okay, so um, let me. Uh, uh, so this is really the, the, the main idea, and maybe I can uh, start by explaining it on a very simple toy model. So my toy model will be the following. You, let's say that you, uh, so uh, it's a toy model, so uh, obviously for that toy model I don't need to do this, this whole analysis, but it's just to explain to you how it works. So my toy model will be minus dxx, say u plus u, equals some um, g, okay? And I will look at this on the whole half line, zero plus infinity, and I will assume, uh, so I'm taking uh, u at x equals zero equals u naught, something like that. Um, and I'm taking g to be compactly supported. So uh, say uh, g is supported in zero one, okay? And so I want to study this problem. So again, uh, for that problem, you don't need to do uh, everything that I'm, you don't need to introduce a, a, a transparent boundary condition. You could use, just use a lax milligram lemma, but okay, bear with me. It's just, uh, I just want to explain to you how it works. So the point is the following. Uh, as soon as you are far away from the support of G, so say in the, in the interval, uh, one plus infinity, yes? I want to look at decaying solutions. I want decaying solutions. Yeah. I want to look at decaying solutions. Uh, so if I'm looking at things on the interval one plus infinity, then I just have dxxu equals u. Okay? So u is a sum of uh, exponentials. I discard the one that, uh, that is exponentially growing. I will only keep the one that is exponentially decaying because I'm looking at decaying solution. So on the interval one plus infinity, I know that u is equal to some constant times exponential, so u of x, exponential minus x. Okay, but I don't know what the constant is. Okay? But I observe that I have dxu, which is minus c exponential minus x, so it, this is minus u. In particular, at x equals 1, I have dxu plus u, which is equal to 0. Okay, and so now I replace the equation by the following model, minus dx x u plus u equals g in the bounded interval 0, 1. So I'm still taking u at x equals 0 equals u naught. And my boundary condition at x equals 1 is dx u plus u equals 0 at x equals 1. Okay, so I have replaced my elliptic equation in an unbounded domain by an equivalent one, 
in a bounded domain with a transparent boundary condition at the top or at the right hand. Okay? And now you can perform energy estimates for, uh, for this problem. You, okay, you can check that the boundary condition at x equals 1 uh, gives you a positive contribution when you integrate by parts. Okay? Uh, I leave you this as an exercise. And so <coughs> once you have constructed a solution of this problem, again, uh, it's a uh, the, the, the advantage is, uh, is that it is on a bounded domain, so uh, from a numerical analysis uh, point of view, uh, this is nice because it's always a bother to work in unbounded domains. And uh, from, the, um, from the theoretical analysis, it's nice because you have a Poincaré inequality. Okay? And uh, so once you have uh, this problem in a bounded domain, then you can retrieve the solution on the whole uh, half space just by the taking. Uh, so C, in that case, would be the trace of the solution that you obtain here at x equals 1. Or uh, up, to, up to factor uh, exponential minus 1. No, no, no. Yes, it's supported in 0, 1. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you are outside the support of G. Yes. Okay, so that's the idea on a very simple equation, and in that case, uh, the, the reason that I did this computation is that in that case, you can really see what the transparent boundary condition looks like. And then the idea is to do the same thing uh, for uh, my, my domain, uh, my equation BLW, which is right there. So if I go back to BLW, Okay, the idea is that uh, you, so you have a, your domain omega BL which looks like this. Okay, so this is a, a x equals gamma of y. You introduce here an artificial uh, boundary with, okay, which can be uh, x equals 1, for instance. Okay, I assume that uh, uh, the supremum of gamma is uh, strictly less than 1. Here, on this whole half space, you can perform some Fourier analysis. Okay. And you know that if you have a solution of the above equation, then uh, so you do Fourier in the in uh, in Y, okay. And so you write psi W. Uh, of uh, hat of uh, uh, x and xi, where xi is the Fourier variable of y, you are going to write it as a sum of uh, say a plus or minus of xi exponential minus lambda plus or minus of xi times x. Okay, and so this part is very similar to what I presented in the first lecture. Okay, you uh, you you do um, um, you do a modal analysis, and so you find some explicit solutions which have the um, the following form. The nice thing about this problem, and the reason why I chose it instead of uh, say the the rotating fluid system, uh, which would lead to Ekman layers, is that for uh, this problem, you have a spectral gap. You can prove that the lambda plus and minuses are always bounded away from zero. Okay? Uh, it's not the case for the Ekman layers, which leads to a number of complications. But here, for this problem, you have a spectral gap. Okay, which is nice because it means that your uh, solutions will be exponentially decaying far from the bound. Okay. okay, so you have an explicit representation of your solution um, uh, in, in this uh, uh, flat half space. And so uh, once you have this explicit representation in Fourier, you can uh, compute some... Uh, uh, okay, so in that case, it's not a Dirichlet to Neumann operator that like would be the case for a Laplacian. It's more complicated, but you uh, c compute, okay, so some uh, Poincaré Steckloff operators. Mm. 
which will be involved in your transparent boundary conditions. So what do these uh, Poincaré Steklov operators do? They take the trace, so here uh, uh, I'm solving this problem with boundary data. So, okay, so you solve uh, BLW in x bigger than 1 with some boundary conditions which would be psi at x equals 1 equal say phi naught and dx psi at x equal 1 equals phi 1 and the output will be Laplacian of psi at x equal 1 and uh, dx Laplacian of psi uh, at x equal 1 and okay just uh, I'm, I'm, I'm adding a little term here this is just to help uh, later on with the, uh, with, uh, with the energy estimates, okay? But it's a lower order. So, okay, so uh, you take in the first two traces and the output is the, uh, the, the trace of uh, the Laplacian and the trace of the third derivative, essentially. Okay? So, and then the operator, uh, which, uh, so let me call this, say, phi 2 and this phi 3. Okay? And the operator, which to phi naught phi 1 associates phi 2 phi 3, this is your uh, Poincaré Steklov operator. Okay. This is the one that involves the, uh, the transparent boundary condition. Okay. It's the equivalent of the dx which was over there. Okay. And then uh, you solve your boundary, uh, you solve BLW in this domain, which is bounded in X now. So you retrieve a Poincaré inequality with a transparent boundary condition involving these two operators, this operator at X equal 1. Okay, so eventually. You solve BLW uh, in uh, so omega BL intersected with x lower than one with a transparent boundary condition involving a at x equal one. What I mean by this transparent boundary condition, uh, blah, 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 is the following. So you require that where you, you have dx, Lapla or rather Laplacian psi at x equal 1 minus, uh, and dx Laplacian psi at x equal 1 minus plus psi over 2 at x equal 1 minus equal to this operator A apply to psi at x equal 1 minus um, dx psi at x equal 1 minus. Okay? Again, it's more complicated because you, okay, it's an operator of order 4, so you need to, uh, uh, you, you have uh, two conditions as an input, two conditions as an output, but it's really the same reasoning as this one. Okay, and then this operator has nice properties such as positivity properties and so on, and so you can perform the energy estimate. Uh, I don't really have time to explain all the energy estimates. Maybe I can just say um, uh, a few words, but uh, I won't write down anything. So then you are, you are, what you need to do is understand how you can perform some energy estimates in this canal, in this channel, which is unbounded in y, okay, but bounded in x. So the fact that it's bounded in x, again, allows you to have a Poincaré inequality. Okay, that's the nice part. That's why you introduce these uh, this, uh, transparent operators. But you still need to deal with the unboundedness part in y. And as I told you, the trouble is that you, everything is non-decaying. Okay, so you have infinite energy solutions. Uh, 
so to deal with that, we uh, actually we we use uh, some estimates that uh, um, oh, were in, uh, introduced by uh, uh, Ladizhenskaya and Solonikov. But actually, I think in in this uh, linear simple case, we could do a bit otherwise, and I, I think it should be possible to uh, uh, just to 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 use weighted uh, energy estimates, okay? So you, uh, you perform classical, uh, uh, say, H1 estimates or H2 estimates in that case. So you multiply your equation by psi and also by a weight that is exponentially decaying in Y, okay? So you get energy estimates on this. So you have uh, energy estimates in a weighted space. And then you notice that you Actually, everything is translation invariance in Y, okay? And so you can uh, say, uh, so I told you, you take a weight that is exponentially decaying, but you can shift the place where it's exponentially decaying, okay? So you, uh, you essentially, uh, you translate your weight with, uh, thanks to the uh, eta k, which is over there. So I, I never wrote it down for this, uh, case where you have these uh, transparent operators, but I'm pretty sure that you could somehow simplify a bit the, the estimates of uh, Lajianskaya and Solonikov by just uh, using this way. Okay, so um, uh, this is essentially the idea of how you deal with rough boundaries. When you add in some nonlinearity, of course, everything gets more complicated because uh, well, messier. So you, first, but, but the idea remains the same. You solve in a half space. Uh, you need to use a kind of fixed point theorem to treat the nonlinearity. And then you still introduce these uh, somehow transparent operators. Instead of just having the transparent operators, you re somehow replace that with uh, uh, an implicit function theorem. Okay? You, uh, you, you, you prove that the, there exists uh, a trace of the function of, of its normal derivative on the line such that you can paste everything together, things like that. But okay, it, uh, you can uh, really adapt that to quasi-linear set. Okay, so uh, I'm already getting a bit late, so I think I will uh, go now to the, the third uh, part of the uh, lectures, which was the Stationary Prandtl equation, unless there are questions first. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, so I didn't do all the computations. I think it's the scaling where all the scales talk to each other, okay? If you have something that is much rougher in the sense that the scale in Y is much smaller, then the, I guess that you would first get an equation in Y, which would just be uh, dy to some high power equals zero. So probably you would first average out everything with respect to Y, and then you would have a superposition of scales, I, I guess. Okay, so you would just you would first have a, um, a boundary layer which handles the very small scales with respect to y, and then a larger one uh, which would perhaps be more classical. That would be my intuition, something like that. But I guess if you put some very rough things with respect to y, then you you just have a mixing process at this very small scale first. Perhaps, but I didn't do any computation, so I, I cannot be too positive. Okay, over here. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it, yes. So that is the case. I did this to localize little y relative. Yeah, actually, you, you, you really, in that problem, you really treat a small y as a parameter. Okay. So when you put it together, yes. the solution for finite epsilon, yes. you have to say something. So you yes, yes. But essentially, uh, 
because you have a scale separation between the two. Uh, so every time you will have derivatives with respect to small y, they will be lower order. So the idea is then that you can compute a solution up to any order. So you will need to add some correctors because when you compute that uh, full derivative, there will be uh, the main order terms will be the derivatives with respect to capital Y. But then you will also have cross derivatives uh, with respect to capital Y and small y, for instance. I guess that's what you mean. Um, OK, so the main order term will be this one. And then you will also have some remainders in your solution corresponding to the derivatives with respect to small y of that solution. Okay. right? Uh, but these you plug in as error terms in some next order term in your expansion, and so on. And you yeah. keep pushing your expansion. I don't think so. So here, small y is bounded, right? It's with between 0 and 1. Small y is bounded. Yes. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I don't think you have no, any. Anyway. You have decay in x and boundedness in capital Y. Decay in capital X and boundedness in capital Y. So the fact that you have this boundedness, yeah. uniform yeah. boundedness, yeah. allows you, yes. So, uh, so now I'll go to the last part of my lectures and uh, in this last part I wanted to talk about the stationary Prandtl equation. Okay, so uh, this will be a bit different from the first lectures that I did because uh, so first I'm using slides and not the, the board but also it's more of a survey of results uh, and it's a domain in which there have been uh, and there still is uh, uh, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot going on say so there's a, a wide body of uh, literature so my purpose is to let's say walk you through the the, the different results around the stationary Prandtl equation um, and to so I, I won't go too much into the proof or maybe not at all, and uh, but I'll, I'll tell you a bit about what remains open today. Okay. Okay. So uh, and yes. So I, I will be talking about uh, some uh, results. Uh, so about a lot of results that are not my own, but also some that I did and the ones that I did uh, I did them with uh, uh, Frederic Marbach, Nader Masmoudi, and uh, Jean. -Rick. So first, uh, let me remind you a bit where the stationary Prandtl equation comes from. So you already saw David's talk, for instance, in which he, uh, he derived this equation, but I just thought I would uh, uh, include it again. So the starting point is to look at 2D Navier-Stokes with a small viscosity. So uh, here I'm denoting it uh, new, okay, uh, in a half plane. Um, okay, so you're... Uh, ah, there. So see here you have this uh, very small parameter. So again, this is uh, when u is small, this is a singular perturbation problem. Um, and so you, you need to guess what the solution looks like. And the, the very important input, not the only one, but the very uh, the, uh, the important uh, input of uh, Ludwig Prandtl was to uh, propose this ansatz, which is still called the Prandtl's ansatz. Uh, which is to say that when you are far from the boundary, you behave like the solution of 2D Euler. But when you are close to the boundary, there is a boundary layer of typical size square root of nu, and the okay, this scaling is important, uh, in which the solution behaves like this. And so you have a, uh, so it's a typical case of match test synthetic. Actually. Uh, and so when you, the solution, uh, when you plug this expansion into the Navier-Stokes, system, the equation that you get for the tangential velocity, which I denote small u, is this one. It's called the Prandtl system. So you have a source term. Uh, so as David explained, uh, the gradient of the pressure within the boundary layer is constant with respect to the normal variable. So the only thing that you keep from the gradient of the pressure is the trace of the 
gradient pressure uh, uh, of the pressure in uh, of the pressure gradient in Euler, okay, on the boundary. So it's a uh, it's a data, okay. It's not an unknown. Um, and as you leave the boundary layer, you match the trace of the Euler flow on the boundary. Um, so a few. So this is the equation that I will be uh, looking at in the in the in the rest of the talk. It's a scalar equation because it only bears on the tangential part of the velocity small u. The the normal part of the velocity v is given by the uh, divergence free condition. So here you can replace v by minus the integral from zero to capital Y of two x. Okay, so you really have a closed equation for you, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, so you have replaced uh, a system of uh, of two unknowns or maybe three actually by uh, just a scalar equation. Um, <coughs> so in this talk, I wanted to review a large body of results uh, on. Uh, Different subjects, and so this is a, so it's the same type of image as the one that David presented in his talk, except that I think his was nicer than mine. But uh, okay, so here you have a, I think he had a tennis ball, this is a cylinder. Okay, so you have a, a 2D flow which is arriving on this cylinder from the left. Okay, and so what you see in this picture is that at first the streamlines remain attached to the object. And at some point, you have a, a separation of the boundary layer, okay, because the, the streamlines detach themselves from the um, from from the, the, the surface of the, the object. And uh, after the separation, you have a very turbulent behavior, because as you can see, there are a lot of small scales, maybe small vortices within uh, uh, in the in the aftermath say, of the of the um, of the cylinder. And so <coughs> in this talk, actually, you, we're going to follow the flow. Okay? Uh, so first, I will talk about what happens here before separation, when you are far away from separation. And this is the case when uh, there is no recirculation, which means that u, the tangential velocity, keeps a constant sign. Okay? So this is typically the behavior that you have right there. Um, then. I will talk about what happens here uh, right before separation, okay? Uh, so at, at this very point, but on the left of it. And then at the, the end of the talk, I will present some very recent results about what happens, okay, no, not here because uh, you have a turbulent behavior and I think this is widely open, describing this, uh, uh, de describing in mathematical terms what happens uh, here where you have these very small scales. This is uh, in, uh, in the stationary setting completely open. But maybe I, I will talk about what happens at the very right of this, uh, right after separation here, when you don't uh, have this uh, small scale formation yet. Okay. Uh, but when you have what is called recirculation, which means that U is allowed to change sign. And uh, yes, also the, the point that I wanted to make is that actually, um, so here I'm, you might think that I'm drifting a bit away uh, from uh, geophysical flows, but actually not so much, because if you, if you consider this model and you add in some nonlinear terms, then uh, there are some regimes in which the, the boundary layer equation for Western boundary currents is actually pretty close to the Pontel system, okay, with some extra terms, but it, it, it actually has some uh, resemblance to, um, to that. And uh, actually, you know, uh, you know that so the, the, the Gulf Stream, as I told you, is a Western boundary current and it's formed on the, um, the coast of the United States. And then somewhere uh, along Florida in uh, Cape Hatteras, I think, the Gulf Stream detaches itself from the American coast and then it goes across the Atlantic and it joins Europe and so on. And this separation of the Gulf Stream is uh, believed to be a, a truly nonlinear effect that is similar to the separation in the Pontal system. Okay, so actually, uh, even if the Pontal system in itself is not really an equation from uh, uh, geophysics, okay, it's, I think it's a uh, 
so first it's a fundamental equation from fluid mechanics uh, from a general point of view, but also it might shed some light on uh, some uh, geophysical processes. Okay, so uh, this talk is focused on the stationary setting, but uh, there, there are also a lot of results on, in the time-dependent case. Um, and I, okay, I thought that I couldn't completely uh, uh, push them aside. So let me just give you, I just have one slide on what happens in the time-dependent case, but uh, uh, in David's talk, he, uh, he described these mechanisms uh, uh, Okay, with, uh, with a lot more detail. So, but okay, just to, to, to a quick reminder. First, the point, when you add in a time derivative here, so you add a DTU right there, okay? So you look at the time dependent setting. Uh, in that case, the Prandtl equation is well posed when you work in a high regularity space, such as uh, analytic, uh, with analytic data or Gevray data. And so I think the, uh, the optimal one is Gevray uh, one half in X. Uh, so, um, and the other setting in which you have, uh, in which you have well posed an S is the, uh, the setting of monotone solutions. So this was uh, uh, noticed by Olenik in the 60s, uh, but there it has been uh, revisited more recently uh, using uh, so Olejnik used uh, a transform called the, the Coco transform to uh, exhibit this well-posedness um, feature, but uh, it has been revisited recently by, um, let's say, some more uh, by energy estimates. Okay, but even if you have uh, well-posedness in high regularity spaces, as soon as let's say, as soon as you leave these two settings, uh, either high regularity or monotone solutions you have instabilities that develop in short time, okay, in all subolef spaces. So this is uh, what David explained in his talk. And uh, also there are, there's a number of works uh, showing that even if you start from a, an analytic initial data, uh, your, the solutions will display singularities in finite time. So you can actually, and, uh, in the recent works of uh, Colo and co-authors, you have um, they they are actually able to um, propose, say, a blow-up scenario for the the the, the frontal solution. Okay, so to 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 explain what the blow-up really looks like. Okay, so uh, now I won't be talking at all about the the time-dependent setting, and I will. Uh, I'm going to. to talk about uh, you know, the, the stationary equation. And so I will start, maybe I can keep my, uh, my picture of the, the cylinder here to explain uh, which part of the story I'm talking about. Okay. So you have this uh, cylinder. Okay, <laughs> I drew it very large. Okay, I didn't mean to. Okay, uh, so you have the flow arriving and then it detaches at some point. So this is the separation point. I will denote this x star. And right now, I'm looking at what happens here. OK. OK, so uh, again, this is the stationary Prandtl system. I denoted the right-hand side by g of x. Again, it's a scalar equation in the, on the tangential um, part of the velocity. and. Um, the nice thing that Olejnik noticed in the 60s is the, okay, is the following. So, uh, so actually, so forget momentarily about this uh, transport term. It, it's uh, very important in the Prandtl equation, but just to fix ideas, just forget it for a, a minute. Then if u is positive, okay, so you are uh, uh, moving along this flow, okay, so and if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, what happens in a cross-section right there, uh, your uh, velocity profile will look like that. Okay? So u remains positive, is u. Um, then it looks a bit like a parabolic equation. Okay? It looks a bit like a nonlinear heat equation if you just have u dx u minus dy y u. Okay? So you expect it to be well posed. Uh, as an evolu if you look at it as an evolution equation with respect to x, and you impose uh, 
not an initial condition, but let's say a boundary condition right there at x equals x naught, you expect it to be well posed at least for short times. And this is exactly what uh, Oleinik proved. So she proved that if you start from a u naught, so that would be uh, your, uh, your inflow condition right there, which is positive. Uh, there is an important assumption that the first derivative at the boundary is strictly positive, okay, and then you have some compatibility conditions. Then you can construct a local solution. Okay, and uh, okay, I have to say that um, I, uh, I, I love Olenik's work, and, uh, and uh, I'm very impressed by everything that she did on Prontel because it was really. Uh, Okay, for 30 years, it remained, I think, the only works on Prontel. It was, a, it was really a groundbreaking. And, uh, and also, it was not that far from what, uh, let's say, engineers were doing at the time. So, so she was really uh, doing some very fundamental work on, um, uh, on, on an equation. And it was um, quite up to date, I have to say. And I really admire that. So, I have to give a lecture about her next week, so I'm, you know, I'm testing it on you right now. Uh, but, 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 uh, but yeah, I, uh, I think this is really a, a very nice result. And so here is uh, the, the idea of how it goes. She uses a nonlinear change of variable, which is called the von Mises change of variables, which really uh, highlights what I just told you, that uh, actually it looks like a, a diffusion equation as long as u remains positive. And so the advantage of this change of variables is that it uh, removes somehow the, the bad part, which is this one, which is non-local. Okay? So it, it uses the, 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 the purpose of this uh, change of variables is to transform your equation into a nonlinear local uh, parabolic equation. Okay? So uh, your, you, your new unknown is W, which is the square of U. Okay, so you, uh, when u is positive, obviously, uh, you can uh, go back from uh, w to u by just taking the square root. Fine. And then the, the, the important thing is the following. You take a new, an, um, a new uh, normal variable. Instead of taking y as a normal variable, you take psi, which is the stream function, and which is so the integral from 0 to capital Y of u. So obviously, if u is positive, uh, okay, this is a... Uh, diffeomorphism or uh, at least locally okay so this is a, a good normal variable as long as u is positive because uh, it's increasing in y okay and then in these new variables your equation looks like that so it's a bit like a porous medium equation so you have a, a right hand side which is given and uh, okay this is a, a, a non-linear diffusion operator non-linear diffusion equation. so this is a really nice. And then uh, since this is a classical, uh, well, maybe not classical, but it's a, it's a parabolic equation, so it's a bit degenerate because w vanishes at uh, y equals zero or psi equals zero. So this is the main source of difficulty in uh, everything that, that she does. But nevertheless, the ideas I would say are uh, classical parabolic tools. So you obtain some a priori bounds on your solution by computing sub and super solutions, okay, explicitly by hand. Okay, you, you compute them in terms of psi. You, uh, so you exhibit sub and, sub and super solutions. Then you uh, can uh, you know, uh, put w in between these uh, sub and super solutions. You do the same for the derivatives and so on. And so you get plenty of bounds for, the, for w. Okay, and uh, also one uh, one remark that I will use in the in the following is that uh, monotony is preserved by the equation, meaning that if you start from a boundary data here from an inflow that is increasing with respect to y or increasing with respect to psi, it's the same thing. Then uh, this remains true for all i. Okay, and, uh, and then as long as you remain in this framework, so as long as you uh, uh, have a, a Prontel equation that is uh, well posed and without any recirculation, so in the framework uh, designed by Olenik, you can justify the Prontel and that. Um, so these are fairly recent works. I think the first 
published one is uh, by uh, Guo and Nguyen, and it was published in 17, even though I guess their paper uh, arrived on the archive uh, maybe a couple of uh, years before that. Um, and so the, the paper by Guo and Nguyen is set above a moving plate. Uh, so the, the reason why you do that is that if you are above a moving plate, instead of having u equals zero on the boundary, you have u strictly positive on the boundary. So it removes some degeneracy in your uh, solution and in the equation. Okay, so it allows for better estimates. But then, um, but I, okay, I would say that this was a, a first step in the improving the the Pronto Landsatz. Uh, and then, so I haven't quoted all the papers uh, that have been written on this subject on this slide. Uh, I hope that I mentioned everyone that worked on the subject. But for instance, uh, Samia Ayer uh, wrote uh, many papers in different contexts on the justification of the Prontel and that, and I, I, I just mentioned the, the last one, I think, with uh, Nader Masmoudi, in which uh, they justify the Prontel and that around the Blasio solution, and they have a result that is uh, globally next. Okay. Um, so I would say that uh, the, the, okay, I cannot say too much about the proofs, uh, first because I don't have time, and also because uh, uh, it, it's very technical, and it, you know, when it's very technical and it's not your own work, <laughs> I'm always a bit afraid to, to well, uh, say things that are not true. Uh, so, um, but the idea, as I understand it, is the following. So the, the, the first step is to, com to construct an approximate solution at a sufficiently high order. And so to do that, you, uh, you, you solve the Euler and the Prandtl profile. So the nonlinear part, uh, the, 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 the first order term is exactly the one that, I, that is given by Oleinik. And actually, in these works, the main order term is, uh, is, uh, is explicit somehow. Because uh, so in the papers of uh, Ayer and Masmoudi, it's the Blasio solution. And in the paper of uh, David and Yasunori Maikawa, the main order term is a shear flow. And then you, uh, you, you construct higher order profiles by looking at the linearized Prandtl equation or the linearized Euler equation um, around, the, around your main order. Okay. But OK, even if that is technical, I would say that this is the easy part of the theorem. And then the hard part is to prove energy estimate. And to do that, you have to um, to exhibit some coercivity property of your linearized operator around the main order part of your solution, so uh, which is uh, uh, Euler plus Prandtl. Okay, and so th this is the main difficulty, uh, and it so it has been done in uh, it's done in different ways in the different papers that I uh, quoted. <coughs> um, I think in the paper by uh, David and Yasunori, uh, you, you do this by using a splitting scheme, scheme right? Uh, by, uh, le, uh, yeah, so, so it's a coercivity uh, property on the Orsa-Marfeld operator. But I think what you explained is that it's difficult to obtain coercivity in just one step. You need to use two steps to, 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 to prove that. And uh, in the latest paper by uh, Ayer and Masmoudi, so which is again uh, around a different type of solution, they have a very, um, so there are two ideas for you. You need to use a, a nice unknown for which you are able to prove these energy estimates. And also they prove that they have a, an interplay between the relay operator, which uh, describes transport, and the diffusion one. And this interplay, uh, acts in a positive fashion, so it, uh, it, 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 it's helping you, okay? Um, it gives you some uh, extra accuracy. So the, you really need to analyze in a fine way wh wh what is going on for the linearized operator in order to be able to prove this, uh, this uh, well-posedness of the Prandtl and that. But uh, maybe the, the one thing that I can stress and I didn't up now is that everything is done in Sobolev spaces. This is the big difference between the stationary case and the time-dependent case. In the, um, the time-dependent case, every time you want to prove the Prandtl, not every time, but most of the results of uh, uh, 
well posed nests and the, the proof of the parental ansatz are set in high regularity spaces, such as analytic spaces. In the, the stationary case, you can do everything in Sobolev space. Okay. okay, so now I'm going to boundary layer separation. So I'm moving along the flow and I'm going to describe what happens here at the very left of X star, okay? right before it separates. Uh, maybe I'll, before doing that, I'll go back slightly uh, in the in Oleinik's theorem. There is one part that I didn't comment. So uh, Oleinik is able to prove that a solution exists for any source term. Okay? But actually, uh, what she proves as well is that if the source term here has a nice sign, and nice means that the pressure gradient is negative or the g of x is positive, then actually your solution is global in X. Okay, so there is no separation. And why is that? Well, it's just because if you start from an initial, uh, so look at the assumptions, okay? Uh, in order to, to be able to build a local solution, you need U to be positive and have a positive first derivative. If you have a right-hand side here that is favorable in the sense that G is uh, non-negative, then this will propagate the sign that you have on U, okay? So you'll be able to um, continue your solution. Uh, so the, the, um, in what follows, I'm going to look at the case of an adverse pressure gradient, meaning that the right-hand side here is negative. And uh, the easiest negative term that you can plug in is minus 1. So this is what I will be looking at. OK, so uh, I'm looking at monotone solutions with an adverse pressure gradient. So if I start at x equals uh, x naught or 0 here, this is what my, uh, my profile looks like. And the red arrow, so in blue you have, a, so this is a cross section of the velocity. Uh, the, the blue is my uh, velocity profile, OK? The red arrows indicate that you have a, a positive pressure gradient, so g is equal to minus 1. So you are pushing your flow and make uh, and uh, your, your flow is decreasing in x okay because you have a, a right hand side that here that is negative okay so at some uh, x naught that is uh, slightly bigger you will have the same type of profile but steeper and then so but you keep the monotony okay because i told you that monotony is preserved by the equation and uh, you keep doing that until you reach a point uh, where you have the following type of picture, okay? So uh, is that du over dy is equal to zero. So if you look actually at the assumptions in Oleinik's theorem, this is exactly the point where, well, you, you, uh, you, you look at uh, what is the point after which you cannot uh, extend your solution thanks to Oleinik's theorem, and it's precisely this one, okay? So it is, this, uh, is, this uh, is a negation of the red assumption in the Leibniz theorem. Okay, in a, uh, I told you that uh, the, the assumption that was in red was that the first derivative was positive. Well, the first point where this is violated is the point where the first derivative is equal to zero. Okay? And if you keep uh, pushing with the red arrows, then you expect that at some later point, x bigger than x star, you will have the following picture. So you will have uh, what is called a recirculation bubble. Okay, so if you have something which is equal to zero here and you keep pushing, then you will have this zone where u becomes negative in the vicinity of the boundary. And this is what I will talk about in the very last part of the talk. Okay, so that point x star, where the derivative of u on the boundary vanishes, is called the separation point. Okay, so this is how you. Uh, it's a, it's a definition, and so you can uh, see it either from a, a again, you, you can see it from a purely mathematical way saying, okay, this is uh, the, uh, the last point in a, uh, uh, I, I cannot extend a Leibniz solution beyond that point, or you can draw a picture and guess that this is exactly the point where you will uh, begin having some problems. Okay, and so the questions uh, that we asked ourselves were the following. So first, does that really happen? So can you cook up solutions uh, such that their uh, first derivative vanish? And if you can, what is the rate at which they vanish? So there had been a number of uh, predictions uh, before. Uh, so this is a, a result that I obtained with uh, Nader Masmoudi. 
And, uh, but there had been some results and computations before uh, what we did, obviously. Um, and so the first one were performed by uh, Goldstein in, uh, uh, in the late 40s and then uh, by Stewartson in the, in the 50s. And you see, so when you look at these dates uh, and the proximity with uh, Olenik's result, which was at the beginning of the 60s, this is really what impresses me, actually, the, 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 the proximity between uh, the works by engineers and the result by Olenik, even though it's not, uh, not exactly on the same subject. She was really you know, looking into things which were uh, done fairly recently by engineers. Okay? And so, uh, by Goldstein and Stewartson do the following thing. The, the Prandtl equation has a self-similar structure, and they use that self-similar structure to uh, propose some kind of asymptotic expansion of the solution. Um, and so, but, but, but uh, okay, uh, these papers are not so easy for me to read, but from what I understand, actually, they, they cannot uh, determine all the coefficients in their asymptotic expansion. They're, they're able to compute the first ones and say what the solution should look like at main order. But then at some point, there are some coefficients that are uh, underdetermined, and they, they, uh, at least I cannot uh, completely uh, understand why. Um, around the same time, there was also a heuristic argument by Landau. Uh, in which he predicted this rate, which was the same as the uh, Goldstein one, by the way, uh, by completely different arguments. Uh, and actually, Landau's characterization of separation is not that this should vanish, but rather that V should become infinite. And by requiring that V becomes infinite, using the divergence-free uh, condition and so on, he uh, is able to predict that rate. And, uh, the, the, the proof is, uh, I think the proof is really, the, what, the, the idea is really beautiful. Uh, okay, and then Wainan E announced in 2000 a result uh, giving a qualitative description but, uh, with Caparelli, but they, didn't, uh, they never published a complete proof. Uh, although I think actually there are uh, some recent results which, uh, which uh, we choose this idea, and I will uh, go into that uh, uh, a little later. Uh, OK, so the result that we have is the following. So you consider the Prandtl equation with a pressure gradient which is equal to 1. So that's the uh, right-hand side, which is minus 1. And then you can construct some initial data that are uh, strictly increasing and that have a prescribed behavior uh, uh, in the vicinity of the origin. And then you can prove that separation occurs at a finite distance. Um, and actually, you can prove that the rate of separation is exactly the one that was predicted by Landau and Goldstein and Stewartson and so on. Uh, you can also prove uh, an error estimate between the approximate solution and, uh, and the actual one. And you can compute uh, and, uh, the, the approximate solution is essentially a, a Taylor expansion of uh, uh, close to zero. But yeah, so the important thing is that you, uh, you can have an explicit rate of, uh, of, uh, of separation here. OK? Uh, OK, so this is what I, uh, I just said. Uh, and so just to go back to the result by Caffarelli and E, actually, there, so there is uh, this uh, recent result by uh, Shen, Wang, and Zhang. And I think that actually uh, what, what they do uh, in a, uh, is um, more or less what Caffarelli and he had in mind. It's, uh, I think it's really, uh, it's, uh, it's really very close. Uh, but, but, but I think if you put these results together, it tells you that within the Prandtl equation, this rate of separation is somewhat intrinsic or universal. And the other point that I wanted to make is that at the separation point, so at x star, so you can compute v thanks to the divergence-free condition, and you find that, uh, well, because the uh, ux will blow up, because it will be like x star minus x to the minus one half, v is going to blow up at separation. Okay? And so this was Landau's characterization of separation, and uh, so actually uh, we have a v that becomes infinite right there. Okay. Uh, I won't 
I'm not, I don't have time to, to talk about the proof too much, so I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about the tools, but um, very briefly. The general idea is that you need to build a good approximate solution of your uh, equation. Uh, okay, so, so that's uh, fairly classical. And then you control the error uh, between the true and the approximate solution thanks to energy estimate. Uh, the, I would say that the, the difficulty is, um, or one of the difficulties is to understand how you construct this approximate solution. And we used some tools that were. Uh, Okay, developed by uh, Merle and Raphael after the works of uh, Zakharov and Sulem and Sulem for uh, dispersive equations such as uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. But actually, this has nothing to do with dispersion. The, 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 um, these are tools that are well adapted to equations that have a scaling invariance, which is the case for quantum. Okay. And so the idea is that you perform a self similar change of variables with a scaling parameter, and the key point is that the scaling parameter depends on the solution itself. And in our case, our scaling parameter is precisely the, um, the first derivative of u uh, at the boundary, which is the quantity that vanishes at separation. Okay. And then you use techniques that are called uh, modulation of variables to find what the asymptotic law for lambda is. So actually what you do is you, you find a kind of uh, approximate ODE satisfied by lambda. Okay? And this approximate ODE will dictate what the rate of cancellation of lambda is. Okay? Uh, so I, I don't have time to say much more about, uh, about this. So I will skip the next slides there and go to uh, recirculation. Okay? So now I'm going to study this part. So, as I just said, at the separation point, uh, the velocity becomes infinite. Okay? This is what you find with the Goldstein singularity. This is a problem, because it, when you derive the Prandtl equation, uh, you assume that everything remains bounded. Okay? It's, a, it's an underlying assumption throughout the derivation. So the fact that you have a quantity that becomes unbounded at some point somehow invalidates your whole derivation in the first place. Okay? So this means that uh, at the formal level, your derivation is not correct. And actually, what is believed in the, say, maybe the engineering community or the, uh, the, 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 the mechanics community is that at the separation point, th this, uh, this singularity, the Goldstein singularity, is an artifact of the Prandtl model, but it's not there at the level of Navier-Stokes. It's not a physical singularity. Okay? It's really, um, yes, it's an artifact of the model. It's, a, it's an inconvenience and shouldn't be there. It means that your model is not a good model at that point. Okay? So it means that at the point of separation, you should forget about Prandtl and put in something else. Okay? Uh, okay, so then the question is, what is this something else? Uh, the, the, the model that is uh, uh, suggested uh, is the triple deck model. So the idea is the following. As long as we remain far away from separation, you can use Prandtl. Okay, actually, uh, I, I just, uh, so I, I didn't prove it, but some people proved it. And uh, this is what I mentioned in the first part of the of the talk, you can justify the Prandtl, uh, the Prandtl ansatz as long as you remain far away from separation. Okay? Then when you are close to separation, here you need to do something else. And this something else, uh, okay, there are a lot of boxes, but should probably be the triple deck. Okay? So the system that uh, David presented in his talk, it has not been studied yet in the stationary setting, but you should probably add a patch here. So uh, the, this patch should, should be, I think, uh, David, you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, size uh, new to the 3 8 in, uh, in this uh, x direction. And uh, so it should be bigger than new to the 1 half. Uh, uh, so what is the size of the upper deck? So it's at least new to the 1 half uh, for the, the 
the main deck part, and then, and then it should be a bit uh, bigger than that for the upper deck. Maybe, uh, I don't know. Is, yeah, okay, it's the same. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, okay, so it's uh, three eighths in both uh, directions. Okay, so you should add here in the vicinity of X star a small box uh, that somehow smooths out the singularity, the Goldstein singularity. That's the purpose of the, the triple deck theory. Okay? But that part is open, I would say, in the stationary setting. Okay, and, but then you, what you can reasonably hope is that in the, if you keep going along the flow, uh, so you have this Goldstein singularity which is smoothed out by the triple deck, and then you keep going on, and here you have a region in which uh, you, you are no longer covered by Olejnik's theorem in the sense that you takes both positive and negative values. So here your flow looks like this. You have a, okay, you, you have u which is negative close to the boundary. Okay, and then this line is u equals zero, right? And uh, so you have a kind of bubble like that. Okay, and the question is, how can you have a well posedness for the Prandtl equation uh, with such flows that have a, in which u changes sign? Okay. Okay, so uh, this is essentially what I uh, just mentioned. Uh, so the, the, if you uh, look at that box, it's uh, essentially the one that I drew uh, right there. Uh, the general idea is the following, you want to solu construct solutions of Prandtl. So actually, fortunately, you have some flows that are well known, which are called the uh, Faulkner scan flows, which are semi-explicit, they are given as a solution of an ODE, but you can prove that they have exactly this type of behavior. They are negative close to the boundary and positive far from the boundary. Okay, so they, they do exactly what you want. And so in mathematical terms, your, uh, your, your, your problem is, is this. Okay, let's perturb a little the Faulkner scan flows. Can I construct a solution in the vicinity, in the vicinity of those? Okay, okay so uh, if you look at what happens actually, so I told you when u is positive, you have a kind of uh, parabolic equation. The issue is that when you change a sign, you have a kind of backward parabolic equation. Okay, so you should be careful where you put your uh, what type of data you are you are taking. Okay, so if you look at a box like this between uh, x naught and x one, so the definition of x naught changes throughout the talk. And I'm sorry about that, but okay. <coughs> uh, so here my x naught is not uh, is not this one, obviously. Okay, this is x naught and this is x one. Uh, so you should put data or boundary data only at the places where uh, it's allowed by, let's say, the parabolicity of your equation. So you should put them uh, at x equal x naught at the point uh, in the region where u is positive and at x equal x one in the region where u is negative. So right there on the blue line, right? Uh, and the line u equals zero is an unknown of the problem, okay? Uh, it, it's, it's part of uh, what you're looking for. So uh, it's a kind of free boundary problem. So there are many difficulties associated with this problem. The first one is, uh, as always, the fact that uh, the, the, equa the Prandtl equation is non-local. Okay? So uh, even if you look at the linearized equation in the vicinity of the Faulkner scan flow, it's not so obvious how you can solve that. Okay? Uh, the equation is nonlinear, the geometry is important, which means that, for instance, if you perform a nonlinear scheme, you have to be very careful to preserve the structure of the equation. Okay, and I will uh, talk about that a little later. And you, as always, uh, in the Prandtl equation, you have a potential loss of derivatives, and you, uh, you need to look for high regularity estimates to construct a solution. Okay, so these are major difficulties. They are, uh, they are, all, all, um, they are here when you uh, have non-recirculating flows, but I would say that they are made even harder when you have some recirculation, okay? But these difficulties were overcome very recently in a paper that uh, went out on the archive about uh, one month ago by uh, Samir Ayer and Nader Masmoudi, and in which they proved some a priori estimates 
for the parental system in the vicinity of a Faulkner scan flow. So this is, they address exactly the three points that I'm mentioning right now. Okay, so it's a, it's a very nice paper. Uh, the point that I would like to make in the remaining three minutes or so is that actually this is not sufficient. Uh, it's one of the rare cases in which having a priori estimates as good as they are, unfortunately, does not give you a solution. Okay? A solution. Yeah. So you can, uh, a priori estimates work like this. They say, if you have a smooth solution, then it satisfies, uh, its energy is controlled by the norm of the data, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And then you have a second step in which you construct a solution, usually by a compactness method or by a, uh, an iterative scheme or whatever. Uh, so you construct a solution that satisfies your uh, a priori bounds, and you pass to the limit, and uh, you obtain a solution of your original system. In most cases, this step is easy, and actually we skip it. Uh, but this is a case in which uh, this step fails. And so let me explain to you why now, on a simpler model. Okay? So I will explain that on a, a toy model. So don't get me wrong. Uh, this is a very, very nice paper, and obtaining uh, a priori estimate is definitely a crucial step, and is definitely a step that you need. Okay, uh, I, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, okay, really, I uh, have a very good opinion of that paper. I'm, I'm not uh, saying anything else, but uh, I'm saying it's not the end of the story, unfortunately. Okay, uh, so instead of looking at the whole Prontel system, I will look at this one, so I dropped the non local term. Okay, so I'm looking at a kind of Burger's equation with a viscosity. Okay? <clears throat> so for that system, you, you keep part of the same difficulty. Okay? So uh, I'm looking at it, say, for y between minus 1 and 1. And so I observe that if I take uh, u equals y, then I have a, so, okay, this is an explicit solution with the right hand side, this, this, uh, this is 0. And this is changing sign. Okay? It's y, so it changes sign across y equals 0. Okay? And so I can ask exactly the same question for this simple system. Okay, I can say, okay, now I want to uh, perturb a bit the boundary conditions at x equals x0 and x1, and construct solutions of uh, my perturb equation in the vicinity of uh, this linear flow. Right? Okay. So uh, again, this is a simpler uh, model than Pronto. So, uh, the, the first step is to understand this very linear problem, because if you, if you want to construct solutions, at some point you are going to linearize in one way or another, and so you will need to, uh, to understand what happens at a linear level. So, at a linear level, I'm first studying this, uh, let's say, toy model of the toy model, which would be uh, y dx u minus dyyu equals f. Okay, in the domain, and uh, maybe I can draw another picture right there. I know that I don't have much time left. Okay. <laughs> but let me. Okay. Okay, so this is your domain. Here you have y equals zero. You're putting in boundary data here. And here, okay, and so you're solving this equation, y dx u minus dy y u. So it's forward parabolic in this part of the domain and backward parabolic in this part, right? Okay, so this has been studied a lot actually uh, a while ago in the 60s and 70s. So you know that there exist weak solutions that they are unique. This is a result of Bowendia and Gritvard. And actually, there are results by Pagani uh, in the 70s, which are quite involved and which uh, uh, use, uh, actually, they, they, he uses a bit the, the same tools as what uh, Samir and Nader use in their paper. So he, uh, he doesn't call them uh, uh, airy profiles, but in fact, uh, he has a decomposition of the solutions into uh, airy profiles, uh, even though he gives them a different name. And so you can prove that if the, the, the source term is in L2, uh, then your solution has some additional regularity. And the, the other thing that you observe is that, OK, uh, if you differentiate formally your equation with respect to x, 
then your uh, x derivative satisfies the same equation. Okay? Uh, with a source term that is fx, and you can also identify what your boundary conditions should be. So, for instance, say that you take f c infinity uh, compactly supported within your domain with zero boundary data, okay? Then, formally, you can take as many x derivatives as you want. All your boundary data will always be zero, okay? And, uh, and so you think, okay, this is great. I can have a, a solution that is as smooth as I want. And this is false. Okay, so your reasonable intuition is that if f is smooth and uh, satisfies some compatibility conditions, so again, let's say that f is uh, compactly supported, uh, okay, uh, say that this is the support of f, right, and again, I'm taking something smooth, everything is zero, okay, you think uh, everything is fine. And this is false, and here is the reason why. So you're, you're, you're uh, maybe, uh, I'll just explain that and then I'll stop. Uh, your equation for a, a, a good candidate for ux is the solution of this. Well, v equals fx with, uh, say, uh, v equals zero on the boundary. Okay? So, as I told you, you, if f is very smooth, you can always construct the solution of this equation. Okay? And then you want to, to prove that this is actually ux. Okay, so I'm going to define a U1 in the following way. If I'm in the upper domain, I'm going to integrate from x0 of v, sorry. And I'm, if I'm in the lower domain, I'm going to integrate up to x1 because my boundary data are here and there. Okay, so in the, the upper domain, I'm integrating like this. The lower domain, I'm integrating like that. Okay. So this U1 satisfies the equation, uh, this one, in, uh, both in the upper and in the lower domain. It satisfies the correct boundary conditions. Its derivative in x is v, so everything seems to be nice. But the thing is that U1 does not satisfy this equation in the whole domain. Why? Because it has a jump on the dashed line. Okay? So you, in general, the jump of U1 is non-zero, and the jump of dy u1 is non-zero as well. Okay? So you cannot patch the two things together. Okay? And so the only case in which you can patch the two things together is the case when u1 and dy u1 have a, a zero jump on the line, and this happens when the integral from x0 to x1 of ev of uh, this quantity and this quantity the x are both zero. This is the necessary and sufficient condition to say that u1 is equal to u and to say that the derivative of u is smooth and satisfies this. Yes. I'm taking them to be equal to zero. I'm taking the delta i's to be equal to zero, because uh, this is simplifies a little, uh, okay? So this is the necessary and sufficient condition to be able to say that actually your u is smooth and that is uh, x derivative satisfies this, okay? Okay, and now if you look at things in terms of f, uh, the application which to f associates this, this is a linear form. So you can write this as the scalar product with, of f with uh, some uh, L2 function, okay? And there is no reason a priori why this should be zero, even if f is super smooth. Actually, you can identify exactly what the, 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 the function in the scalar product is. So you can identify exactly what the condition on f is, and it has nothing to do with the smoothness of f. It's really, it's an orthogonality condition. It's quite different from any kind of compatibility or regularity condition, okay? And obviously, the same thing, so this is not an artifact of this equation. I can perturb the coefficients and it remains true. Okay, okay so I'm uh, almost done. So, uh, okay, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll skip that a bit. Uh, and so the result that we have is the following. For our toy model, 
what we prove is that you have a manifold of codimension 2. So codimension 2 is exactly the fact that your data should satisfy two orthogonality conditions. Okay, that's why you need your data to be uh, in the manifold of codimension 2, uh, such that the toy model has a solution if and only if the data, so here I put the assumptions on the boundary data, but you can add a source term, it's the same. Uh, if and only if your boundary data are in this manifold. The difficulty is that obviously your manifold depends on the solution itself. So uh, yeah, it's complicated. You have, uh, you have some uh, orthogonality condition that depend on the solution itself. And you expect the same type of result to be true for Prontl. So even if you have some a priori estimates, in order to be able to construct a solution, you need to satisfy some orthogonality conditions. And how many? Uh, well, if you take k derivatives in x, you need to satisfy 2k uh, orthogonality conditions. Okay, so if you take 100 derivatives in x to, be, to work in a high regularity space, that's 200 uh, orthogonality conditions. Okay, and that's life. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, Okay, so you, you expect to, I, I do expect that uh, you can make this work for Prontl, but uh, I, I'm sure that it's a bit of work. Okay, so I'll stop here. So the, the, I, I would say that now we have a fairly complete understanding of what happens uh, before separation. More recently, what happens after separation. What is missing is really that part with the triple deck. Uh, in the, I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for going over time.